First at Five. From the University of Florida's College of Journalism and Communications, you're watching WUFT News. Welcome to WUFT News First at Five. I'm Meg Porterfield. And I'm Brenna DeLong. Thanks for joining us. We begin this evening with the latest in a deadly hit and run case that gripped the Gainesville community. University of Florida student Maggie Paxton died while crossing University Avenue back in 2020. Joshua Figueroa was the man behind the wheel that night. Today, he learned how long he'll have to spend behind bars for the crime. WUFT's Emily Zuluaga joins us live from the Alachua County Courthouse. Emily, a difficult day for everyone involved. Good evening, Brenna and Meg. I'm here live at the Lachua County Courthouse where earlier today Figueroa's attorney said this was a long and difficult case. And for the Paxson family, they are still visibly heartbroken. You know, this is a wound that has not yet healed. But from what I saw earlier in the courtroom, the final verdict was able to bring some sort of relief. Closure is what Judge Philip Pena brought to the case against Joshua Figueroa. I don't know the word if it's closure or it's, it's a, something we're moving past and now we celebrate Maggie's life and who she impacted. Figueroa is the driver charged with the hit and run that led to the death of University of Florida student Maggie Paxton in 2020. Closure is uh, held in different parts. It's different doors to closure. And yes, this door is going to close today. Figueroa was adjudicated, found guilty, and sentenced to six years in the Department of Corrections, followed by 15 years of felony probation and a license suspension of 10 years. Paxton's friends and family mourned inside the courtroom as the end of the sentencing marks the beginning of moving on. I was remiss in not thanking all the people who wrote those impact letters because without those, we would have gotten the four years. Under Florida law, leaving the scene of an accident comes with a minimum mandatory four-year sentence. Given the overwhelming evidence in the impact letters sent from loved ones, Judge Pena did not feel the minimum was enough. No sentence will ever bring back a bag. No sentence will ever be equivalent to what happened to her and what decisions were made on that day. Judge Pena received more letters in support of this case than he's ever received, all emphasizing the spirit Maggie possessed and the pain that is now left amid the tragedy. There's nothing that can be done to bring their child back. Uh, you heard that by the passionate uh, conversation they had, the letters, the impact letters that uh, the judge received and he read in court. Um, and this is just a, the next step for them where they can move forward with some level of closure. Another point to note here is that Judge Pena said that the final sentence does not reflect the value Maggie's life had. Figueroa will start his sentence today. That's all for now. Reporting to you live from the Lachua County Courthouse, Emily Suluaga, WUFT News. Thanks, Emily. We're joined now by WUFT's Richard Mason, who was also at the courthouse. Richard, the sentencing hearing was originally scheduled for Wednesday, but was delayed because Figueroa mysteriously ended up in the hospital. What do we know about that? So all we do know is that he was actually undergoing a medical procedure, and that was actually the reason why he was actually not present on Wednesday, but that did not stop him because today he was in court. And Emily referenced victim impact statements in her story. How much influence did that have on the sentence he received? So what we do know is that the actual letters, uh, the impact letters specifically, it carried a lot of uh, context in regards to the character of Maggie Paxton, just touching on her aspects of uh, being a part of the community uh, and for uh, family and friends. And we understand the judge read portions of those letters in court today. Can you tell us any more about that? Again, the judge just touched on the sentiment behind the character of Maggie Paxton and the influence and the impact that she left on her family and friends in the community, just touching on those sentiments more than anything. But that's all I have for you right now. I'm Richard Mason. Back to you. We appreciate those updates, Richard. For more about the sentencing and the timeline of this story, visit WUFT.org. Now, WUFT's Julia Haley joins us with the weather forecast. Julia, I'm ready to see some sun. Can we expect any? We started off our Friday afternoon with some showers, but we're finally getting some sun for this evening. But expect some showers for tomorrow. Ooh, As of right now, look 
at those clouds in the sky currently clearing up just a little bit. That sunshine peeking through 79 degrees, but feels just a little bit warmer at 81 due to that humidity in the area. 84 for Ocala, 83 Bronson, 84 High Springs, 88 Lake City, 94 Jacksonville, 82 St. Augustine, and 83 Daytona. And for this evening, of course, that chance for stray showers, but overall, just looking at those cloudy skies and temperatures going to drop about 10 degrees by tomorrow morning. Back to you. Thank you, Julia. The January 6th committee held its first meeting since the violent riot. In yesterday's meeting, we heard disturbing new details that unfolded at the Capitol last year. The committee revealed evidence that former President Donald Trump agreed with Chance to hang former Vice President Mike Pence. At least four Trump aides also testified. They told him and his team he lost re-election. Former Attorney General William Barr admitted he made it clear he did not believe the election was stolen. The committee is led by Republican Representative Liz Cheney. Also on the committee is Orlando area U.S. Representative Stephanie Murphy. She tells us what we can expect in the upcoming meetings. You will in um, parts as the hearings um, proceed. What I think is key to take away from that is that given all of the information that we have gathered, we have uh, found that this was not a spontaneous event that happened on January 6th, that there were a lot of actors who were working together, searching up uh, for ways in which the uh, former president could retain power despite the fact that the American people had voted otherwise. And we will be laying out uh, that testimony, that evidence over the next couple of weeks. The next January 6th committee meeting will be Monday, June 13th. Just ahead on first at five, we'll get into COVID news, including what you need to know before planning your next trip. Stay with us. You're watching WUFT TV News. Welcome back to WUFT First at Five. Brenna, there's been a lot of COVID related news lately. That's right, Meg. There's updated travel requirements, new information about vaccines for kids, as well as a new study. Let's get into it. The Biden administration announced today travelers entering the U.S. will no longer need proof of a negative COVID test. That's according to a senior administration official. The change will go into effect for U.S. bound air travelers at midnight Sunday, June 12th. The official said the CDC is lifting the testing after determining it was no longer necessary based on current science and data. The CDC reports it will reassess its decision in 90 days. Officials can reinstate it if needed. And the first COVID-19 vaccinations for children under five could start as early as the week of June 20th. But as parents wait for a final decision on vaccines for this age group, a rollout plan is already underway. CNN's Mandy Gaither tells us what parents need to know. It's what many parents have been waiting for, the protection of a COVID-19 vaccine for young children. Realistically, it means we could see shots in arms of kids under five as early as the week of June 20th. FDA vaccine advisors are set to meet next week to discuss authorizing emergency use of Moderna's COVID-19 vaccine for children ages six months through five years and Pfizer's vaccine for children six months through four years of age. Pending those decisions, the CDC will make final recommendations about the vaccines. But before that even happens, the White House says it's planning for all scenarios. Last week, 10 million vaccine doses were made available to pre-order for children under five, millions more will be ready to go in the coming weeks. This approach allows us to seed communities with enough vaccine so that it is readily accessible and equitably distributed across the country. While most parents are expected to seek a vaccine from their pediatrician, a senior administration official says additional vaccine clinics and sites will be set up at easy to access locations for parents, including pharmacies, schools, children's hospitals, diaper banks, community health centers, clinics, museums, libraries, and organizations serving minority communities across the country. I'm Mandy Gaither. The White House will partner with state and local governments as well as various health organizations to ship and distribute vaccines across the country. New evidence shows some babies born shortly before and during the pandemic may be developmentally behind. 
According to studies from the JAMA, there is an uptick in delays like talking, walking, and interacting. Researchers and physicians say uneven access to health and child care and limited exposure to the outside world are factors. Experts have long known 85% of brain growth happens before the age of five. Other studies show pandemic babies also vocalize less than pre-pandemic babies thanks to increased screen time and mask wearing. Meg, experts say it could be years before researchers can adequately measure whether the pandemic has a long-term effect on early childhood development. In many cases, the lagging skills are recoverable. That's interesting, Brenna. Another study done by the journal JAMA Network Open focused on pregnancy. They found that pregnant women with COVID-19 may be more likely to have babies who develop neurodevelopmental disorders in their first year of life. Researchers from Massachusetts General Hospital and Harvard Medical School looked at the health records of more than 7,000 babies. They found 6% of those whose mothers had COVID-19 during the pregnancy were diagnosed with neurodevelopmental disorders within 12 months of birth. That's compared to 3% of infants whose mothers were not COVID positive during pregnancy. So not a huge difference. The study authors and outside experts say more research is needed, and if you're pregnant and test positive for COVID-19, the odds are high that your baby will be okay. That's all of our COVID updates. Coming up next, we take you to the Weather Center with WUFT's Julia Haley. Stick around for your seven-day forecast. You're watching WUFT-TV News. Currently tracking those storms all across north central Florida, seeing an increased rain right here in Cross City and some higher activity around St. Augustine and Palatka. But here in Gainesville, looking about 84 degrees and of course all over north central Florida sitting in the 80s. 86 Stark, 88 Lake City, 89 Live Oak and even 93 for Jacksonville and feels just a little bit warmer due to that humidity. So 94 Gainesville, 92 High Springs, 88 Bronson, 89 Ocala and even 98 for Jacksonville. Once again, a very warm day, especially northward of I-10. So take a look at our campus cam outside of our studio seeing those clouds. We had some rain earlier today, but currently clearing up 85 degrees feels just a little bit warmer outside of our studio at 93 degrees and let's take a look at that hour by hour this evening seeing that slight chance for stray showers but overall cooling down about 10 degrees overnight so when you wake up in the morning no more showers thankfully but we should be getting some afternoon showers for the rest of the weekend and into the work week so saturday see that high in the upper 80s and once again another high in the 90s for sunday seeing that warming trend but overall chance for showers in the morning and afternoon so take a look at this future track currently seeing this warm front pass through but it's going to turn into a stationary front as this low pressure system moves counterclockwise bringing some showers into our area over here in Gainesville for both Saturday and Sunday but clearing up by Sunday so we are experiencing that warming trend for the rest of this week as this high pressure system appears in our area just a little bit later this week around Monday meaning that we should be seeing some sunnier skies and some warming temperatures to to pair with that warming trend. So let's take a look at what to expect this week. Seeing those showers and thunderstorms in the afternoon, overall looking at that warming trend throughout the week with temperatures in the mid 90s and muggy conditions, but getting just a little bit drier toward the end of the week. So let's take a look at that six day outlook with that chance for rain in the afternoon and also the morning and those highs rising into the mid 90s by Thursday. Back to you. Coming up on First at Five, sports fans, it's all about you. We talk Gator softball. Plus, we take you to Oregon to check up on Gator track and field. WUFT's Jason Bennett is next with sports. Stay with us. You're watching WUFT TV News. Welcome to sports, I'm Jason Bennett. Gator men's track and women, women's track and field are in action this week in Eugene, Oregon for the NCAA Outdoor Championships. 
Jasmine Moore jumped out in her event this Thursday evening winning the NCAA Outdoor Championships in the long jump, giving the Gators an early 14 points. Gators women track team entered second in the nation while having a program record of 16 Gators participate the men's side of the track. They enter the NCAA Outdoors sixth in the nation with nine Gators participating in events take place tonight and go on throughout the weekend ending Sunday night. Continuing in Gator sports, today Florida Women's Sports Program celebrates winning USA Today's Network SEC Women's All Sports title. Florida Gator Women's Program earns their 24th Women's SEC All Sports title for the program in their 50th academic year. The two, the two women's programs that managed to win SEC titles for the Gators were gymnastics and women's outdoor track and field. Being among eight top four women UF women's teams for the season, for the Gators men's sports program came in second to the Tennessee Vols as they claimed their first SEC overall sports title in program history. The two Florida men's programs that earned titles were men's swimming and diving and men's tennis. Moving to the Diamond, the Tennessee Vols baseball team has been ranked number one all year as they compete among several teams in the NCAA Baseball Tournament Super Regionals. The NCAA Baseball Super Regionals Tournament kicked off earlier today at noon with East Carolina defeating Texas 13-7. Three other games take place tonight as Virginia Tech and Oklahoma are currently underway. Texas A&M take on Louisville tonight at 8 p.m. and number one ranked Tennessee set to take on Notre Dame at 8, 6 p.m. And now on to some entertainment time. I think we have a party crasher. That sounds messy. Ariana Siracos will give us the inside scoop on entertainment. Hi, I'm Ariana Siracos and this entertainment time with me, Ariana. Today we're going to dive into pop culture, a new movie release and a crazy ex, yikes. Britney Spears got married yesterday, but of course we all have that one ex that can't seem to move on. The baby one more time singer got married yesterday to 28 year old Sam Asghari. Her 55 hour ex-husband from 2004, Jason Alexander, wanted to be toxic and crash the wedding. Here's the inside scoop guys at the wedding, Jason Alexander. What's up? Marvel Studios released Miss Marvel starring Iman Vellani. This is Marvel's first Muslim superhero. The character Kamala Khan is anticipated to appear alongside Brie Larson in the 2023's Captain Marvel movie sequel, The Marvels. So your brother told us about your Avengers party? He did. We have decided to let you go. Really, really. <laughs> I'm Maria Sarkos, and that wraps up today's dose of entertainment news. Hope to see you next time. Before we go, one last check on the weather. Starting off our Friday evening with a chance for stray thunderstorms and showers, but overall cooling down about 10 degrees by midnight with those lows in the low 70s. But for the west rest of the week, expect that rain and those showers to continue in the afternoon and that warming trend to rise even into the mid 90s by Thursday with those lows in the 70s. Back to you. Thanks, Julia. BBC World News is next, and the PBS News Hour is coming up at 7. But your Florida news is always on at WUFT.org. Have a good night.